Well, Kathy, thank you so much for taking the time to sit with us. You really are one of the most prolific producers, someone who understands that intersection between innovation and storytelling. So if we go back and look at the, some of the films you've done, E.T., Poltergeist, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, the Back to the Future trilogy, the Indiana Jones trilogy, Jurassic Park, Twister, Benjamin Button, all of these films. And the one thing there is that we've had all of these moments that have really changed storytelling and filmmaking. Can you tell me a little bit about the calculus that goes into you going into these situations and having that trust that the technology will be there for you to tell your story? Well, you know, I think it's interesting. I'm not so sure that I have the trust in the technology being there. I mean, I have the hope that the technology is there. I have the trust in the people. And I think what I've had the good fortune of doing is working with amazing companies where I get a sense of who the personalities are. I have a sense of what is on the horizon because the advent of technology often can influence the way you think about story. So I, I've also worked with amazing filmmakers who are always, you know, literally trying to do things that have never been done before. That's kind of a phrase that gets used a lot where somebody's like, well, we got to try this because it's never been done before. And then you're sitting with people saying, okay, it's never been done before, but some aspect of it is familiar and has been done before. So how do we use this story to push the technology to the next iteration? And that that's what I think I've, I've had the benefit of being a part of is watching story keep pushing technology. As I think about some of the other producers that they'll, they'll go into a situation and be a little bit more conservative because at the end of the day, there's a lot that's on a producer's shoulders, right? But for you, I think you've kind of taken a different approach and, you know, I've had the fortune of seeing that a few times. Well, I, I also think you have to kind of be somebody who's a little bit comfortable flying by the seat of your pants, you know? I think that kind of comfort with risk taking a little bit is a really, really important thing that I recognize that for whatever reason, I tend to be kind of exhilarated by that. <laughs> I don't mean irresponsibly, but when I'm around people who I think are incredibly talented and comfortable with the idea behind innovation and trying new things and wanting to push technology to a different place, it's, it's really what it's what brought John Favreau and I together most recently because the two of us were just kind of talking about how we couldn't believe that movies have gotten made the same way for so many years. Mm -hmm. And why not start thinking about doing things a little differently? Why not look at the workflow in a different way? He was right in the middle of Lion King and, and had done Jungle Book and I, here I was, you know, doing all the things that we were doing with Lucasfilm and had walked into the amazing, you know, environment of innovation that George had created. And we were just like, what's the next step? Mm -hmm. Where is this all going? And we realized we could create a show that would actually push it to the next level if we had the support. And uh, amazingly, we got the support right away. I want to go back to, to one of the, like, pivotal moments, because it seems like each one of these times where we have one of these pivotal moments where cinematic storytelling is going to change, mm -hmm. it seems like you're right around that. So if we even think about the blockbuster, mm -hmm. you were there for all of that. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward to, for myself, I walked into the theater and I saw the first Jurassic Park test and it, it was the, the CG uh, T-Rex coming across this, this plate that had been shot up on Lucas Valley Road. Mm -hmm. And I knew in that moment, filmmaking had just changed, like, like fundamentally changed. For you, how were you sure that this was something that you were going to be able to leverage for a blockbuster film? You know, the interesting thing is, and I, and I really do, it's interesting you should say that I've had the opportunity to be on the cusp of so many things that have been changing along the way. And to, to have just been there pre-Jurassic and watched the optical transition into digital, 
as you can imagine, none of this happens overnight. None of it happens overnight. And so every project that I was involved in or have been and continue to be involved in, it's usually, I would argue, it's, it's really something you're watching happen over a three to, say, seven, eight year period of time. It's kind of a slow burn. There's things being tried. There's shots you may do in a film. Hey, we could try this. Something works, something doesn't. On Jurassic Park, what was interesting is Stephen had decided to do Hook, which had actually delayed Jurassic, which when I think back was a very fortuitous situation because had Hook not come along and we had done Jurassic, we would have done a stop motion um, process more than likely. Um, we were working with the parks, for instance. We were trying to see what was going on with animatronics. We were creating tests with these tracks. Stephen, one of the first things he said to us was, I want, it, I want a T-Rex to run. And we could get one leg kind of doing this, but we couldn't get the whole animal running. And we were trying to figure out how to do that. Stan Winston was at the table. Phil Tippett was at the table. Dennis Murin was at the table. So what I've found is with these technological shifts in our business, it's often when you can get all the right people together, working together, having a clear consensus around what everybody's trying to do, but maybe not a clear consensus as to how to do it. And that's what's been so exciting, is to watch the convergence of these minds and the convergence of technology in service to a dinosaur running, let's say, and everybody, whether it's somebody working in a theme park, somebody who's grown up doing puppeteering, someone who's you know worked in optical effects, they're all working together to try to figure out what's that next iteration that's going to try to make this happen. And the, the ideas around stories have never changed. Mm -hmm. All that's happening is the technology is servicing the imagination. So the imagination was becoming realized inside the technology that existed 10, 20 years ago. Now it's being realized virtually in ways that we're just beginning to kind of see and experience. I, I think that's, you know, in the context of the team also, I, I find that to be fascinating because it means that you have the various departments are in tune with what's going on, not just for that project. Well, it's interesting though, we're talking about this because departments have been in tune in a very traditional way of storytelling and then there's the handoff to post-production what's happening with virtual production today is and this has not been easy what we need to shift is having those department heads involved much earlier so they're actually working as part of the team in pre-production they're working as in tandem with the script being written they're working in tandem with concept art being developed they're working in, ta in tandem with previs. And the story is shifting much closer to animation, much like the animation model. So that by the time you get to post, all that decision making has been moved way up. Mm -hmm. By the time you hit blocking and staging and all of that inside of previs and virtual scouting, the shooting process is really now the finally. And that's that's difficult for a lot of people that are working in traditional filmmaking and television today to really get their head around. And not everybody can do that. That's another thing. The, the training doesn't really support that. There are many people who are excellent storytellers, filmmakers, showrunners, whatever, who they want to step into an environment where they can find it and they can find it on the day. That's really tough with virtual storytelling because you have to create things in advance. So there's a different kind of education that's actually gonna take place, I think, in the next 10, 20 years. Even in film schools, you know, everything, you know, in the, in the process of trying to figure out how we make a real genuine shift like we did with something like Jurassic Park, where suddenly everybody was stepping in and talking about computer generated effects in, in a kind of ubiquitous way it, it exists today. That's gonna happen, but it's a ways off.
it's still tricky to get people to start to think that way. Yeah, I mean, I look at it kind of in that context of that shift that happened in Jurassic Park, and then to start to think forward to, for example, Twister mm -hmm. or Benjamin Button, or it felt like at that point there was more of an ecosystem and understanding of how far you could push. I think what happened was you realized what was possible. And what we experienced with Jurassic Park, where we had basically 63 shots, we did with the computer. And at the time, you know, we were using SGI and giant computers. And as the, the computing power began to catch up, the realization that you could do more and more and more shots changed the way you thought about storytelling. And that's another thing that's going on today, is it really does change the approach to what it is you think is possible, because that's all we're ever doing. And I think even going back to the beginning of time of movies being made, silent movies, and then the advent of sound, and then color, and all these shifts that have happened in our business that have brought us to where we are today, it just shows the resilience of the movie business, which is once somebody makes a breakthrough, once you realize you can do something differently, once it looks real, because that's ultimately often what you're trying to achieve, and you're having a new experience, then of course it's gonna catch hold. You know, it's like a brush fire. And then everybody wants in on it, everybody wants to learn how to do it. And that happened with Twister. I remember when we didn't even really have to pitch the story because Dennis and a few of the guys at ILM had this one shot where a tornado comes down this road and picks up this, this tractor trailer and flings it at the camera. And you just, I, I remember when we showed it to Warner Brothers and they were like, oh my God, okay, yes, make that movie. <laughs> they didn't know what the story was. We, we hardly knew what the story was. But we felt the same excitement because we thought, oh my God, if we can do that, then everybody's going to be in. They're going to see something and feel something they, they've never seen before. That's really exciting. I mean, that's that kind of juxtaposition between that kind of storytelling and having that trust in the team yeah. and that technology, knowing that you're going to be able to push I think it. there's nothing better, Miles, than having a group of people trying to figure out something that's never been done. We don't always get to do that. Sometimes we are doing maybe the same thing, only trying to do it better. But when you're on the cusp of really trying to do something that's never been done, it's just, there's nothing like it. It's just an adrenaline rush. It's amazing. And when, especially when you succeed and you succeed on a level that you, it's one of the things that's an interesting conundrum around group experiences versus something you're gonna see alone in your home or with just a few people. Because those moments when you can achieve showing somebody something they've never seen before, when you can experience that with a group of people, there is an added benefit to that. I mean, one of the things, and, and getting into, that, let's lead into virtual production, because I think virtual production, look, there were a lot of elements of it that were pre-existing, as you had pointed out before. It's mm -hmm. like, when are all these things going to kind of hit at the same time? Can you talk a little bit about that that yeah, time frame? I, I think the most interesting thing about virtual production is the person whose point of view and vision it is stays engaged through the entire process. It used to be, or is now to some extent, a handoff process. It doesn't mean that a director can't follow everything through in the post phase with computer generated effects, but more than likely, they're not sitting in a visual effects house, looking at every shot, looking at dailies the way we used to years ago when we were doing optical effects and we would do all of post at the end, we would cut the movie, go into a screening room, look with the visual effects supervisor and everybody contributing to the shot. We were looking at every single shot, continuing to iterate continuing to comment. Now that's actually coming back in a weird way. What's happening is all those department heads are working with the director and the screenwriter and the concept artist and the production designer. They're all, all these people are contributing to the storytelling and that iterative process is 
carrying through into virtual blocking, virtual scouting. Decisions are being made. Adjustments are being made. Adjustments to the story are being made. By the time you start shooting, all that input has happened alongside the director. And by the time you get to the actual post process, those decisions, those creative decisions have pretty much been made. You're just finishing, you're putting the finishing touches on. And that allows, I think, the creative process to be much more fulfilling. And I think storytelling will improve. Ultimately, like animation, the longer you can iterate on something before having to put those final touches, just getting an actor into a space where they can see what they're involved with. Most recently, Ewan McGregor shooting Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now he could feel completely immersed in the environment on the volume. It changes his performance. It changes his connection to what it is he's doing. And he kept talking about it every day. He was like a little kid in a candy store. He just couldn't believe how amazing it was. Even one of our executives in the early days of Mandalorian, when very few people even understood what we were doing with virtual production, walked onto the set and he looked around and said to John Favreau, I, I didn't think you were building anything. And he didn't realize he was standing in a virtual set. It really, really excites me. You talked about the green screen and Ewan McGregor actually seeing and being able to react to things. Mm -hmm. It's also the DP. A DP coming to a set, not really knowing where the light source is gonna be, not being able to use their ability to move light around and really create something that's really compelling for the audience. Or the set designer being able to not only enter Back with what's in the physical space, but also what's in the virtual space. That must be exciting to see that iterative process and people working together again. Well, also, I think for the DP, what's extraordinary is these locations can be chosen early on. And so when they come into the process at the beginning, they have the opportunity, again, to actually paint with light. You know, we talk about that in terms of making movies, but they actually take on some of the control. And then probably the most important thing is if they have to go back and they have to pick anything up, if we have a reshoot, if we have to do anything again, that lighting has already been set or it's been captured on a plate on location. And by using the LED screens, they're actually getting the interactive light on the actors, on the props, on the sets, on, in the environment, in exactly the way they want. So there's, in many ways, there's far more control. Yeah, and that's, that's exciting. I mean, I talk about creative collaboration. Like, it seems like that's what this new phase is bringing, that ability for more ideas to be able to come, to have more to work with. I, don't, I, I think it's more ideas, but I also think it's an opportunity for the key people that are making choices and decisions about the look and the feel of something, actually having a lot more time together. They're not going off and doing their thing. They're actually all in the same room. To have every department head doing virtual blocking, for instance, and having input and having a DP say, actually, you know, I don't really want this to be afternoon light. I'd like this to, you know, look somewhat differently. I, I, you know, I'd like it to be a cloudy day. And everybody gets to weigh in on what impact that has on the story. What impact does it have on, you know, what somebody might be building, how the production designer might be even setting a window. Where's the door? What every bit of control in what that image is going to look like, what that frame is going to look like, has the input of all these people and all these people at the same time. That doesn't happen in traditional filmmaking. We've been making right. movies the same way right. for a hundred years. Today, it's changing, but basically it's been the same for a long, long time. And it works. There's a lot of it that works. And one of the things we talk about all the time, and I think George was genius at this, is you know he, he created a lot of things that changed our business. The edit droid, which led to the Avid 
the, the tools that led to Pro Tools in post-production. And, you know, I could go on and on with everything he did with ILM. But what he did that was really genius is he made everything feel familiar. He looked at what it was, and then he extrapolated from that so that people didn't feel like, oh, God, I have no idea how to do this. They could walk in and go, oh, yeah, this is new, but it feels and operates in a somewhat familiar way. And I think with virtual production, that's part of the challenge. We, we've got to find ways that this feels familiar to the DP, feels familiar to the production designer. That language has to continue. I'm already seeing with the people that we're trying to introduce to what we're doing, say with Mandalorian, that they step into an environment that immediately feels somewhat intimidating. They recognize its value, but the process is what feels like it's intimidating. So if we can find a way that the process feels more familiar, and whether it's a production designer walking in or the DP walking in or an AD trying to figure out how to schedule what is happening, if they can recognize it and they feel that it's still grounded in what they're used to doing, then I think this takes off even faster. But right now, it's a little bit intimidating. You know, the minute somebody puts goggles on and starts doing virtual blocking and looking at locations, I've watched people just literally walk into the room and they don't even want to put the goggles on. But once they do, it doesn't take very long before people start to feel more and more comfortable. But it, it, there is an intimidation factor in what's going on right now. The interesting thing to me is it reminds me of kind of, you know, the difference between some of the newer cars and older cars to use some yeah. car for, where where the car is hopefully doing a lot of things for you. So you actually yeah. don't have to worry. And I get really irritated that I can't work the radio. Yeah, I, I find in a lot of cars. <laughs> It drives me crazy that I can't work the radio. I just want, you know, I want to go to the station I want or I want to stream some music or whatever it is. And I'm like, God, we can't have that happen. That is a perfect example of where technology takes it too far. It's trying to do too many things. And I think that's kind of the beauty of what's happened in the movie business and how we've used technology. Technology can service a lot of different things. What, are we, what specifically are we trying to do right now? What is it from a storytelling standpoint that we're in service to? And what are the tools necessary to deliver on that? Not what are all the tools possible to do everything you can possibly imagine to create an image. It's what are the tools you need to do this? And I think that's the way to think about a lot of virtual technology right now. I think people get overwhelmed with everything that's possible and don't stop to think you don't do that when you walk onto a more traditional movie setting. You're not saying like, bring every lighting package imaginable <laughs> into the set, please. You know, you don't do that. You, you talk to your DP and you get together, you know, what it is you need to service this, and we need to think that same way, I think. I think you're spot on in that. And when you start to look at, there is this tendency for people to over-engineer, but they don't look at the utility. Yes. And even when I think back of, you know, in the 90s, coming up with all of this vocabulary that was totally alienating to, to filmmakers, mm -hmm. I actually think now we're not doing that. Like, I, I have heard of some situations where on set, all of the vocabulary is normal filmmaking yeah. vocabulary. I think John Favreau did a brilliant job of that on Lion King when he went in and he realized that all the people he wanted to bring into the process because they were excellent at what they did, Caleb Dejanel as a, as a DP, as an example, he thought they're not gonna wanna do this because they're gonna feel like they've gotta go back to school and start over. I need to figure out how I set this up in a way that it feels familiar, that they can step in. There's a little bit of a learning curve, but overall, they're gonna be operating in much the way that they're used to. Then you can iterate. Once everybody gets comfortable, then you can start bringing in the additive tools that then begin to expand on what it is you're trying to accomplish. And that certainly happened with John. So. 
I would imagine if you sat down with Caleb today, he would sound like an expert in virtual shooting, but he certainly didn't start out that way. And he was only able to do what he did because he came into an environment that felt familiar. So that, that sounds like that's really what the promise is here of virtual production mm -hmm. is really starting to get people not to worry about the technology and being able to focus more. Yeah, is I've felt that with visual effects though from the time I've, well, now it's been over 40 years of working with some form of visual effects is you, you first you have to tell a story. What do you want? What are you trying to say? What do you want to feel? What, you know, talk in those terms, then begin to add the layers of conversation around execution. It's, it's when people come in and they're only talking about execution and everybody glazes over that it doesn't work. And it's the same way when I hear somebody go, oh yeah, we'll fix it in post. You know, what does that mean? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, it, it should be, what are you trying to accomplish? It's not a magic wand. I say that right now about the volume. You know, I think people come in and they think it's a magic box. Oh, they don't think, how did, how did all this get here? How, how, how is it working? They're just like, oh, I want to do this without any thought that it's all in service to storytelling. Every bit of it. Whatever appears on that screen, whatever set piece is sitting there, whatever that actor is saying, it's all in service to storytelling. So that you should stay focused on. And then you put a lot of really talented people around you to help you with the technical side. I think that that's fascinating. I'm, I'm starting to see also in what you're talking about a certain democratization. And I think, you know, if, if I'm even to go back, that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and who you've been in the industry, it hasn't been easy, right? What do you think in terms of what this is doing to open things up for folks? I mean, the tools are, are free, some of them. People are doing really super creative things with just what they have. What do you think's gonna I th happen? I think, you know, it's interesting. I think about that a lot, even with just the most recent release of the next iPhone, which is gonna allow people to shoot in the aspect ratio for film. It's looking at what you guys are doing inside of Epic and making tools available and the Unreal Engine available. And I think back years ago, I met Neil Stevenson and Neil introduced me to Gabe Newell and took me up to see Steam. I, I, I've never been somebody that's played a lot of games, but I've always been really interested in that as a form of entertainment and increasingly the convergence between what's going on in gaming and the imagery that's being created and what's going on in, in television and movies. The more and more we can bring people into those virtual environments so that you begin to take that sense of community and participation and bring it into the setting where people can actually talk to one another, experience something at the same time, feel the same thing. That's the next game changer. You know, we're on the cusp of that with some of the things going on with gaming, but when other aspects of entertainment can be experienced in that way, that's, that's a game changer. We've been saying for a long time, somebody's gonna make something in their garage and it's gonna hit and it's gonna be gigantic and they're gonna make a gazillion dollars. Okay, I, I, that's wish fulfillment. I think that's fantastic and I think increasingly we're getting closer and closer to that. But I also think these tools are servicing a very high end market. And I know, you know, I have the privilege of working inside of these projects where we're telling stories and we are creating the highest end images and imagery we possibly can. And all of our innovation it goes toward that. That's one kind of distribution and need as you talk about need, because technology is always in service of need, or at least what people think they need. And this democratization, I think, is absolutely fundamental. I, I think even when you look back at the movie business and to the, you know, early to late 70s, when the movie business went from very high end with tons of money being spent making movies to then, you know, shoestring budgets and many more people and broader distribution and opportunity of getting things in front of 
eyeballs. I think now I can't possibly see everything that's out there. I can't possibly see everything that's being streamed. I'm not, I'd have to quit my day job to sit and look at everything on YouTube. I do sit back every now and then and think, well, with this democratization, where is this all going? Because no one can possibly see everything that's being created. So that in and of itself kind of naturally creates a kind of consolidation after a while. And if you go with what George used to always say and probably still does say, what's great is great. And there's very little of it that's really great. And when you think about it, you know, there's the more movies that get made, there's still only a few that are really great, right? <laughs> and we're, here we are sitting with a lot of television and a lot of streaming, and yet somehow most people are talking about the same shows. It doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities for lots of different kinds of shows and points of view and stories, and they get seen by some people, but the majority of things that holistically gravitate toward the largest audiences, it shakes down to what's great. And maybe one day somebody is gonna make something with everything that's available to them that's free, because there's certainly the opportunity is creating itself, and that's exciting. Well, let's talk a little bit about distribution. What do we think this future entails? People are seeing content and taking in stories in various different ways. I always like to say that there's, there's the linear story. I tell you a story. Mm -hmm. Then there's experience. I can experience the story based on what you told me. And then there's the gaming. I can master that experience. Mm -hmm. What do you think? about the future. I, I, I think that there's going to be a combination of those things. I think there's always going to be people who want a passive experience. We have a lot of stress in our lives and sometimes it's just nice to sit down, turn it on, and you don't have to do anything. I also think it's a demographic choice. I think that there are, you know, obviously my kids love a participatory kind of experience. They're looking for that. They also like the social aspect of it. So they want that sense of community. And they may not want that all the time, but they're certainly in search of that more than I am. And I think that what's happening for the future is these choices that you have, these opportunities to experience things in different ways. I'm intrigued by the immersive experience. I'm intrigued by the idea that you could be watching something in a passive way and then you could say to yourself, oh, that looks really interesting. I want to know more about that. So now I have a more proactive way in which I want to delve into something and then I might want to participate. I might want to see what that's like. But those kind of choices, I think, are, are where we're going. And I think that's pretty exciting. I want to ask a last question and then we'll see if I missed anything. For virtual production and those people who are going to be watching this who care about what's going on, is there something that you want to tell them about what this is and how they participate? Are there opportunities? Well, are I, the... I think it, de it depends on who I'm talking to. <laughs> if I'm just talking to a lay person, um, then I'm just saying, you know, the sky's the limit and you're gonna be seeing things and experience things you can't even imagine. If I'm talking to people that I'm working with, I'm talking to fellow creators. I mean, one of the things that excites me so much about where we're going with virtual production is being involved in something like Star Wars. We have digital assets that we've been creating for 40 plus years, and we've spent a huge amount of time arriving at some kind of consistency around how to use those assets. So my mind is blown by the opportunity ahead of us of what I think we could create because of that. So those are conversations I'm starting to have with a lot of people that I work with. And that's a different kind of a conversation. But I, I think, don't be afraid of it. Don't be intimidated by it. It's just another tool that's giving us the opportunity to tell stories. I think a fascinating thing with 
technology right now is now it's the world. There are pockets of people all over the world. I think with the pandemic and the acceleration of communication via, you know, virtual interaction, it's this sudden realization that you can be working with somebody. It doesn't matter where they are. It's immediate. And it's as though they were in San Francisco. But in fact, they could be sitting in Fiji, frankly, and it doesn't matter. And I think that's really exciting because we all know that there's an amazing amount of talent out there. We're seeing it every day. So to be able to funnel that in, into projects that we're all working on and to access that level of talent, no matter where they are in the world, I think that's going to result in some pretty amazing things. And, and that's what we've really seen, right? Mm -hmm. it, you're actually closer to people now in some ways. Yeah. Because you can actually, multiple people, you know, in reviewing or, or reviewing sets or do, people are in disparate locations, well, but they're closer. if you're sitting in one room with yeah. goggles on and you're in a virtual space talking about virtual things, what difference does it make if you're on some other part of the world, except that you might be kind of tired because it's 2 a.m. instead of, you know, 2 p.m. But it, that's what's amazing is that increasingly we're going into these virtual environments to create what it is we're doing, even if it ends up being ultimately live action. But consequently, yeah, we can, we can include so many more people in those conversations and that, that's great. That is exciting. Yeah. That's, it's amazing what is on the horizon. Oh, well, yeah. Kathy, thank you so much for taking the time to sure. speak with us today. Sure.